Welcome to Second Baptist Church, and to all our friends and visitors, thank you for choosing to worship with us today, and we're glad you're here. The flowers on the altar today are provided by Brad and Elaine Pope in honor of their 40th wedding anniversary, and there's more about that in a minute. First, a few announcements. The ABC Nebraska Region Convention is going to be held on October 6th and 7th at Sunset Hills Baptist Church in Omaha, and all the Nebraska Baptists are invited to participate in the worship, worships, workshops, worship, and fellowship. The delegate participants are invited to vote at the annual business meeting then on Saturday, October 7th at 9.30. There's a schedule in this week's midweek if you're interested in checking that out. Also, Pastor Stephen Grace will be offering the next Spiritual Gifts Workshop on October 15th and 22nd, and that's a two-week class that meets right after church and a light lunch is served. So if you were unable to participate in the first class, you can sign up for the October class on the sheet posted back in the gathering area. There's also information about volunteering to help at Matt Topic Kitchen, our next monthly prayer gathering on September 24th, the upcoming men's steak fry, and the annual fall Baptist men's golf tournament in the bulletin. So be sure to check those for uh, more information. So today is Celebration Sunday, and as a special treat, <coughs> oh, excuse me. I'm sorry, I didn't tell you. You're right, you did, but that's I was, okay. I was sitting back there going, okay, so the region convention, and it's on the, the workshops that are there, okay, what they are, are what various churches around the state are doing at the local level, where they, how they're working with their community, okay. So if you want to find out what the churches around the state are doing, that's what those workshops are all about. Okay? Uh, sometimes you think, well, workshops, what does that mean? But, but that's what it is. The, the variety of churches in the, around the state and the local outreach that they're having is, is what the workshops are about. Thanks. No, appreciate it. So back to our special treat. Um, at, you are all invited after church to Brad and Elaine Pope's uh, celebration for their 40th wedding anniversary. We're going to be in Fellowship Hall for a lunch and celebration. So everybody's welcome. And 40 years with Brad's quite an accomplishment. So <laughs> let's have them stand and give them a hand. the September birthdays of Troy Alter, Mary Mills, Matt Shaw, Milo Wilcox, Nancy Schwarzenbach, and Dee Quenzer. Did we miss anyone? Okay. And the anniversaries are Bob and Joyce Howe, Brad Malenko, Mike and Marlene Peters, Phil and Susan Nickerson, and are there any other anniversaries? If not... <laughs>
Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see each of you here today as we worship the Lord. I want to take a few minutes to uh, spend in prayer. We want to uh, pray for those who are in need of, of God's healing touch. I want to offer my condolences, Mike, to you, to your family, um, at the loss of, of your mother. And I know this has been, uh, been a long couple weeks for you, and uh, you've been in our prayers this whole time. I um, want to also congratulate you on some good victories for Waverly High School. <laughs> Mike is a coach over there, and I think, aren't you running 3-0 and right now? We are. That is wonderful. Better than the Huskers. <laughs> <laughs> that's a low bar. Yeah, that's a low bar. Huh? <laughs> but we do. Uh, we also want to uh, continue to, to think of uh, Julia McCord's family. Uh, the funeral was yesterday here, and, and uh, Jackson grandson is here this morning and uh, uh, what a wonderful family it was, a, it was a joy to work with their family and to get to know some of them and um, also just to remember uh, Julia what uh, impact she had in our congregation in the years that, that she has been here I um, want to remember a number of people who are struggling with cancer and are taking treatments uh, we, we Got a number of people in that bowling, and, and uh, uh, want to continue to pray for Sean Blunt and uh, and just continue to pray for each person who's on our prayer list today. <coughs> Let's go before the Lord in a time of quietness and prayer. <coughs> Father, we ask now that you will be with us as we can 
continue in this time of worship. Lord, may your Holy Spirit guide us, strengthen us, encourage us. May we find hope. And Lord, may we be the source of hope for other people as well as we point others to the living Christ. And Father, we pray today in the way that you taught your disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Let's receive our tithes and our offerings at this time. Give generously to the Lord. recent series of television commercials were launched by Governor Christy Nome of South Dakota to recruit a workforce, workforce into the state of South Dakota. And in one, Governor Nome is working as a plumber, crawling underneath a sink, fixing a drain. In another, she is filling in as an electrician. And then at the end of that particular uh, commercial, the state capitol building goes dark. 
as a result of a blown fuse, and she admits that she may not be the right person for the job as an electrician, but that South Dakota would like qualified individuals to move to their state to fill those job vacancies. Sometimes we feel a little like Governor Nome when we are recruited in the church to fulfill a certain task. And that we feel completely underqualified, completely overwhelmed to fill that role at, at, with using our spiritual gifts. When I graduated from seminary, I went to Detroit, Michigan to serve as youth pastor. It took me two years of serving in that role before I realized that I was not at all cut out to be a youth pastor. I mean, I, I like kids and I like working with kids, but... I quickly discovered that that's not where my passion was at all. I never really felt like I was doing what I was called to do in that church. And after two years, I escaped Detroit. <laughs> I moved to North Dakota and took a, a position as pastor, and I've been content since. Not all of us have gifts in every area. I think we can agree to that. And that would be a terrible expectation that somehow we are, as Christians with spiritual gifts, are supposed to be able to do everything in the church. Often, even when we are cut out to do a certain task, there's a, there's a learning curve. It takes a while for us to come up to speed, to step up to the role and to do it well. We might have to learn it step by step from a textbook in some cases. Other cases, we might mess it up a few times and make a debacle of it until we learn from our mistakes and can get it all straightened out. We might have to start over. We might have to learn from others through mentoring, mm -hmm. through walking alongside somebody else who has those specific gifts. We might have to alter our route and how we're doing it and make some directional changes. In fact, in the course of carrying out what we believe is our spiritual gift, we might even discover that it isn't our spiritual gift at all, even though we might have thought it was in the past. And we then have to discover our gifts anew. A physician has something that is called a practice. I heard someone the other day jokingly say, it makes me nervous when I go to this guy who is <laughs> going to operate on me, and it's called a practice. <laughs> You'd think they'd have it down by now. But a physician or a dentist does become better with practice and experience. Every move, every technique is refined and improved, becomes smoother as time goes on. I've heard a doctor reassure patients by saying, I've done 3,000 of these procedures, it's become routine, you're going to be just fine. And we feel a little bit better about hearing those statistics, don't we? Practice does make perfect, or at least almost perfect, none of us are really truly perfect in what we do. But it is true of us. We all know what this, what this is, don't we? You all know what that is? I have discovered that here in Nebraska we don't use those very much compared to where I came from. In the cold north of North Dakota, this tool gets used a lot. But we also know what this is, right? Yes. This is the person we go to after we use that other object too much. When our back begins to complain and our back begins to scream out at us, say, hey, I haven't done this in a while. And we go out and we, we lift heavy loads of 30 pound uh, uh, shovelfuls of snow. We lift it and throw it over onto the snowbank next to the sidewalk. And we do that repeatedly for 45 minutes and pretty soon our back is complaining. Your back is saying, here, I'll give you something to remember me by. 
and the next thing we know, our back is in spasms. Now, this doesn't happen to the guy at the grain elevator who shovels grain every day, all day long. That's right. It doesn't happen to the construction worker who, who is bending and lifting every day. It happens to those of us who spend our free time in a recliner, mm -hmm. or those of us who, are, are, who, who don't use these muscles very often. Our spiritual gifts are no different. That's right. They have to be exercised mm -hmm. in order to be effective. Yes. To have them and to not use them is to endanger them by falling into dis disuse. Now, we, we had our first uh, training session for spiritual gifts, and those of you who have been through it will probably say it wasn't so much a training session as it was to sort of get acquainted with your gifts. And from this point on is sort of the training as we begin to put those gifts into use. We've got another one coming up in October, and a number of you are signed up for that. Some of you couldn't make the first one, so you're going to make the second one. And, and we're going to learn how important it is to put those spiritual gifts into practice. There's a danger of becoming indifferent and apathetic not caring about those who could be affected by our spiritual gifts. So in other words, our spiritual gifts need to be driven by a passion, a passion for other people, to be able to serve and to minister to other people, or to serve alongside other people. Amen. We are again confronted with the reality that everyone has spiritual gifts. You've heard me say that before, and you'll hear me say it again, everybody has spiritual gifts. Look at verse 6 today in today's text, uh, uh, in, in uh, chapter 12. And as we discover in this verse, these gifts are different. Not everyone will have the same gifts. This brings the variety of gifts needed for the church to not only function, but to excel in the mission of reaching the world. It says in verse 6, we have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is uh, prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. Today, we are experiencing the painful aftermath of a highly anticipated football game. I, well, I joked when I first uh, moved here that I could always tell when the Huskers lost because our worship attendance would be down that Sunday. And it is down a little bit today. As I look out there, there's a lot of empty seats. And I think, I don't know if it has anything to do with that or not. I always blame it on that. But I assume that some of you know a, a, a good deal about football. Living in Nebraska, you learn about football. You, you know the difference between offense and defense. And you know the difference between... A, uh, a lineman and a, and a running back. And so um, most of you are pretty good, and some of you know enough to be what we call armchair quarterbacks or coaches, and we know <laughs> the very best thing for the Nebraska football program. However, some of you may not know much about the game, or you simply don't care about the game, and you would rather be watching Downton Abbey, like my wife, than you would be watching... <laughs> watching a football game. Yep. From the first game of the season, the reality is that 133 <coughs> NCAA Division I schools are all competing for one title, and that is the national championship position. Every week, the hope dims for some of those teams, and it becomes a narrow and, and narrower and smaller grouping of schools that end up in the final, to, to be the final teams. But the top teams had to exercise extraordinary teamwork in order to get where they were. A star quarterback can't win the game alone. It just isn't going to happen. There has to be tremendous blocking. Mm -hmm. Blocking up front to give the quarterback time to throw and to execute the play. 
That has to be in place. There are two or three running backs, but only one carries the ball. The other, the other two have to block to clear a path. If the defense didn't do their job and prevent the opponent from scoring, then the offense's advancement on the field and their scoring would mean nothing. Yesterday, I think we had the opposite problem. The offense was doing so poorly that the defense was on the field all day long, the whole game. Now, you've heard me make football and spiritual gift analogies before because, honestly, the two are so, so similar. They really are. My point is this. Every team member plays a vital role. Mm -hmm. You will never hear a good coach say, well, that position isn't really that important. Think of a kicker. There's nobody on the field during the game for less time than the kicker. He's hardly ever out there. But the kicker wins games quite often. But that's true for all the positions. Missing one position from the field could spell disaster for a football team. Yes. And so it is with the church. Every member is important mm -hmm. to the function of the whole body. Amen. Perhaps one of the reasons people stop attending worship, and I think this is true, and not taking seriously their membership, is because they do not feel that the church really needs them. They don't feel like they are really... Uh, that they're really vital to the function of the church congregation. So they can just go somewhere else or they can stay at home because the church really doesn't need them. Now I understand that. Because I've actually quit organizations because I didn't feel like I had a role in that organization. I didn't feel like that organization needed me. We have, in the Kiwanis Club that I belong to, we have members quit because they didn't feel like they belonged. They didn't feel like they the club really needed them. And so part of the disconnect some of our members might be feeling, our church members might be feeling, is might be our fault that we are not putting people to work, that we are not allowing people to exercise their spiritual gifts where they could best serve. Now, on the other hand, those of you who have served on the nominating committee know that you have to make a lot of phone calls and plead with a lot of people to try to get those positions filled. So there's the other side of that too, is people are simply unwilling to use their spiritual gifts where they can best be used. It works both ways. However, the reality is every member is important. Every member is important. Like the football team, every teammate has a gift that, that differs from the others. Imagine if there was a whole team of quarterbacks. Or imagine if there's a whole team of linemen. But God has given to us different gifts so that we function as a team. Amen. In verses 6 through 8 that Joe read this morning, we find that each member of the church is encouraged to use gifts to the fullest. Paul gives several examples here in the 12th chapter of Romans. He begins to name some of the gifts. Now these gifts are not necessarily the same gifts because they may, may have a different title, different name than the ones that we talked about when we do the spiritual gifts uh, inventory. The gift of prophecy is the idea of reclaiming the truth and sharing and spreading the truth. We are to boldly speak the truth of God in our everyday conversation. The gift of service is mentioned, and if that is our gift, then it, that gift of service should not sit idle. We should be using it. It should be used to serve others. The same thing with teaching, the gift of teaching. How ridiculous to have the gift of teaching, but then to never use it, to never be willing to use it. The gift of encouragement is a wonderful gift, and I know several of you, several of you in the congregation have the gift of encouragement. You've been such a, an encouragement to me. I can't 
begin to, to describe how important that is. It's a wonderful gift. Are you encouraging others? Are you putting that spiritual gift to work? The gift of giving. Some people, God has blessed with the incredible spirit of generosity. God has given abundance of possessions to a person. There are some who have plenty to give but are stingy with what they have. But the gift of giving involves being generous with what God has given to you. The gift of leadership should never sit idle. Leaders are always needed. Good leaders also know how to humbly follow. And I'll have to say that Second Baptist Church, Craig was up here talking about the region convention. Craig's the president of the region. Uh, we have many individuals in here who have key positions in the region of Nebraska. Second Baptist is almost overrepresented in mm -hmm. the leadership position, both in American Baptist men and the, the region, for sure. Um, I'm serving at, on the board as the chaplain of the state of the region board uh, to bring spiritual guidance to the board. And we've got others who serve on the board as well. And so Second Baptist has leaders. Mm -hmm. We have leaders right within our own congregation serving the congregation too. Mm -hmm. And that has made such a difference in how we are functioning as a congregation to have that kind of leadership. The gift of mercy is mentioned. It's where a person is full of forgiveness and hope for other people. They offer people mercy when others can only muster up condemnation and judgment. Jesus showed mercy to many people while others were only willing to cast stones at people. So Jesus demonstrated mercy, didn't he? At the, with the woman at the well, with the, uh, the, the woman caught in adultery, the, the, um, uh, the tax collectors. These are all people who are outcasts. The lepers, they're all outcasts in their society. And Jesus showed mercy. And so should we be filled with mercy. But that's an actual spiritual gift. It's something we should all practice. But for many people it comes very easy to show that kind of mercy. Snowflakes aren't very big, are they? You've seen snowflakes. They're, they're little and they're tiny. They say they all have a different shape. If you look at them under a microscope. And if you put one in the palm of your hand, it doesn't last very long, does it? It immediately melts. Snowflakes are frail, but if you put enough snowflakes together, if you stick together, they can stop traffic, can't they? <laughs> Likewise, by God's design, the, the lone Christian, you alone, may not have much to offer, you think. You may think that you don't have, you don't have uh, great spiritual gifts that are going to change the world. But I can assure you that when believers work together, yes. using God's spiritual gifts yes. that he's given each one of us, that we can impact the world. Amen. When two or three are gathered together, that's when Christ's presence is felt in the world around us. When the diverse gifts of the individual members of a local church begin operating cooperatively, yes. when we're working together, that's when impactful ministry takes place. Amen. Yesterday, King Little gave a devotional at men's breakfast. He talked about Julia McCord. When, uh, when Julia, in her last days, I would go over and visit her. I would, I would uh, usually call and say, um, or, or text uh, Carla, uh, her daughter, and say, um, I'd like to come over for 10 minutes. Can I, is now a good time? Yes. So I usually have very short little brief conversations with her. But one of the things Julia always brought up was, was, was unity. The importance of unity. And I believe that this congregation has fantastic unity. We really do. And so that unity, how does that work? When we all have diverse gifts, we all have, have different things that we're able to do, 
But when we can cooperate together, when we have unity in purpose, yes. the body works together, it's amazing what God can accomplish. Amen. We read these ver this in verse 12 of Romans 12. It wasn't part of what Joe read. But I want to conclude with, these, with this, uh, this passage. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all of its many parts from one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. And we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. May God help us to exercise the gifts that he's given to us, to be the church that God wants us to be. Amen. Amen. Two fifty one, please. Turn in your hymnal to two hundred and fifty one. Today, if you do not know Christ as your Savior, I hope that right where you are seated today, that you will invite Christ to come into your life. And if you'd like to join the membership of Second Baptist, I, I invite you, the congregation invites you to come alongside of us so that you can use your spiritual gifts for the glory of God. Let's sing together.
lunch downstairs to celebrate their 40th anniversary. Hope that you will plan to come down and be part of that great celebration. As you go from here today, may the Holy Spirit guide you, walk with you, as you pursue what God has given on your heart to do in this world, using your spiritual gifts to bring glory to his name. Go in God's peace. Let's close on singing our final song, Freely, Freely.